Did you guys see the New York Times story this week about the Olympic National Forest tree poachers? Uh, it was you, crazy. I loved it. Right. You cannot log in the Olympic National Forest, uh, at least in this part of it, if at all, and a group of poachers were going in at night cutting down big leaf maples, which uh, big leaf maple yields this beautiful hardwood that is perfect for guitars and violins. And the poachers were selling the wood to a lumber mill. And so one night they're cutting away and they come to a wasp's nest, which they don't like. So they sprayed it with insecticide and something, some accelerant, probably gasoline, set fire to it. God, this is nice. This is the start of the veins of the maples. They go this way. They just keep getting bigger and bigger. Um, that right there is the prime example of what you're looking for. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't get any better than that because it's covered with moss and that's what protects it and it's uh, it's healthy it's, and it's big. Beautiful. I, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like this, but uh, you don't, I mean, I don't normally. I mean, this is a really live, active, what do they call it, a rainforest or um, uh, ecosystem, you know, it's it's happening down here. Things are going on that, that are beyond us, you know, <laughs> and I think that's what's cool. This, is, I mean, this world wouldn't exist without all this, really. Every season there's something that you can do to make money in the woods, you know, whether it's mushrooms, uh, boughs, um, you know, firewood. If you ain't got nothing, you don't have to go rob your neighbor to get something, you know what I mean? You, you can, you know, even though you can't find a job, but you can go out and you can cut cedar boughs and make, you know, you know, 50 to 60 bucks a day, you know, at the least, you know, and, and not have to rob your neighbors, you know what I mean? I, I see that all, all the time, you know I mean? Nobody, everybody thinks that, Stealing and all this other stuff, you know, I mean, I just hate it. You can probably get, no, that's a burrow, but boom, boom. There's a thousand bucks right there. You know, nobody wants to work anymore. Nobody wants to, you know, but there's always some way to make money. There is. Mushrooms make good money and they're good eating too. Here's an old truffle patch. Not easy. And it's hard work, but there's always a way, you know what I mean? I don't like thieves and I don't like people that steal. You know, it's just one thing that I hated the most, but you know, so that, but you know, I steal trees, I guess, but <laughs> I try to justify it by saying, you know, that I don't steal from your neighbors or, you know, rob a store or hurt anybody, you know? I hate that too, you know? This is Justin Wilkie. Justin has a story to tell about forests. Justin's story is also a story about fire. It's a story about bees and big leaf maple trees. It's a story about methamphetamines, public lands, and Carlos Santana. It's also a story about work in nature in rural America today. Justin's isn't the only version of this story. Here's what federal prosecutors say about Justin. He's a maple poacher, and in 2018, he started the Maple Fire, one of the worst forest fires in the recent history of Washington State's Olympic Peninsula. Three years later, we met up with Justin, and he took us into the woods not far from where the Maple Fire started. He told us a different story. The Justin we met has been a maple poacher. He insists, though, that he's never started a forest fire. God, I love this place. This is where it starts, the mammoth. How did you first come across this place? Uh, 
I ran out of gas over here on Vaz Bridge and um, I was waiting for a ride and I just came in here and went, oh my God. Big leaf maple, the tree that both Justin and prosecutors say he stole, is a common tree in the Pacific Northwest. For years, loggers regarded it as a garbage tree, a nuisance that got in the way of harvesting more valuable trees. But a small percentage of big leaf maples contain a beautiful wavy pattern known as figuring. Those rare trees are highly valued by woodworkers and guitar makers. Yeah, that's what I love about maple trees is because, you know, when my grandpa was logging back in the day, he's, he, you know, he always told me, oh, them trees are worthless, you know, just you don't even look at them things, you know. <laughs> he's like, and that's the way I always was raised, you know, until about 20 years ago and you know, I was led on to that they're worth money, you know what I mean? And I never thought in a million years that maple would be worth money because they were always been the weed in the, in the woods. Some facts about this story no one disputes. In the summer of 2018, there was a bee's nest at the base of a big leaf maple tree in the Olympic National Forest. In the middle of the night, someone set that nest on fire. The fire caught, moved up the tree's trunk, and into the forest canopy. The fire burned for three months and destroyed over 3,000 acres of federal and state forest. One year later, Justin and another man were arrested and charged with theft and arson. It's healthy. It's got nice color in the, in the you know, like sometimes you'll, you'll see in the leaves, they'll be brownish. You know what I mean? You'll see like the brownish tips and stuff like that. This has been hit by the sun all summer long, right? and it's still got really bright green leaves. That's a beautiful sign because it's healthy. And yeah, it might have some, it's gonna have rot in it, but it's probably minimal. Uh, that right there just makes me just, <laughs> yeah. Wait, which one? <laughs> this limb right here. <laughs> <laughs> When it's a beautiful tree, it's not work at all. It's like, wow, <laughs> wow, it's just, it's mesmerizing. You know, and no two trees are alike. Everything's different. And it's like, just like people, no two trees are alike. No situation's ever the same. So it's, it's new, it's like prospecting. So that's exciting when you find gold, right? And uh, at one point, maple was more valuable than gold. That's why people, Go out and steal it. If they, got a, if they can run a chainsaw and they can identify it, and if they can sell it somewhere. Um, I grew up with the, um, logging most of my life. Um, my grandfather was a logger. Um, my stepdad was a logger. My dad's a salesman. I mean, I, I take nothing after my father. <laughs> nothing. Can you explain um, your tattoo a little bit? Which one? This one? When you got it. Oh, it's faded now, but um, it's representing my family heritage, I guess you say, West Coast loggers. It, um, my grandpa was a logger, you know, I grew up logging. I mean, it's in my blood. So I dedicated this to my grandfather, West Coast loggers. He said, there's only four rules of life, son. I said, what's that, Grandpa? He says, falling, bucking, fighting, and fucking. <laughs> All right. But those, are the old, those are the old days. Now loggers are just fat and lazy. They are. I'm just sitting in a machine all day. And Commercial logging began in the Olympic Peninsula in the mid-19th century. After World War II, logging of the area's old-growth forests accelerated. Boomtowns mushroomed as worldwide wood consumption nearly tripled. Then came the 1980s and 90s. Over logging, mechanization, and new environmental protections led to fewer timber jobs, pushing many young people to leave the peninsula or accept less lucrative work. But, um... I literally have grown up in the woods most of my life. I started running chainsaw by the time I was pretty young. <laughs> That's the way I roll through the woods. I'll, like, I 
purposely came through here to because I seen him over there when we were over there. <laughs> like we, that was a tree right there that we looked at first, that big one. And you know, I seen these ones here. I wanted to check them out, but I started bull bucking by the time I was, um, I think I was about 19. I was running a crew of uh, four cutters. I set my guys out and we take our lanes. I put them where they need to be. I didn't graduate or anything, but that was just, I was making 450 bucks a day for six hours. And that, that's really good money at the time. I see the only one that I would ever be interested in would be that one. That would be the one I would go to first, which I did. <laughs> the first thing I look for in a, any unit would be, you know, size of course, right? And then like, you know, you got typical trees that are like, like exactly like this, right? But then you got ones, you want to try to find ones that are, you just got that weird growth to them, you know, they just look, whoa, that's the ugly ones is what you really want to look for. I mean, because the ugly ones really produce. You see how the pattern here is, you know, it's got bumps, but it's still got flame in it too. So it's quilt in flame. This is like where it can't figure out what it wants to do. <laughs> Kind of call it the glitter, the glitter room. That's where uh, where we used to put all of the highest grade wood back in here, just to. Uh, and every once in a while, we'd let somebody in here and look around. Makers, but we keep all the nicest wood in here in the inventory. And some of the flame, it gets really. You see, it gets really wild. That's why I call it flame maple. Looks like it's on fire. I don't know if you can see that very well in the light. It's a pretty piece. The, the quilt, once you cut it, kind of looks like that. The nice stuff. And so it's a, that's a high grade block. It goes all the way through. And uh, pretty rare. It's like a gem. But it's there, so people like it. In a guitar, maple has kind of a transparent sound in a way. Um, and it's been historically used for violin family because of its beauty. So there's always this interest in it. And, and you get the electric guitar guys like the flash, but uh, so do the acoustics. So in, in maple, you can see this is a, a piece from a stump. This is a stump also, and you can see these little ripples. And so the fibers in the maple, and then this on the radial surface, so the tree was going up like that. Um, but the fibers grow like curly hair, essentially. And so you get that, the, the refraction like that. And, Outside the bark, it's difficult to tell if it's figured, but inside the bark, you can you can see. And and so sometimes it's it's more like bubbles, and that's quilt. Uh, but more often, it's it's little little ridges. This is kind of in between that piece here. In maple, the number of trees that are really significantly figured are probably between one in a hundred and one in a thousand and 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 we're not we're not exactly sure where if you hit in the middle it's probably right so it's it occurs infrequently and these would be people who learned how to do this by being loggers or what the people that steal it yeah no no they they are not loggers <laughs> that i can guarantee you no they just they have buddies that probably somehow learned how to do it and, and then one one thief teaches another thief I think almost every person I know that has stolen maple and I know a lot of them are not loggers never have been you know they're just druggies with a looking for a quick way to make a buck so when you go to find a maple if that you think it's any good you fall it on the ground, 
you got what they call a cookie like this. This is called a cookie. All this was all together at once, and then it's chopped outside like that. And see, that's how you tell. That's pretty easy. I think it's just drugs just did it. Drugs are not wanting to work for a living. Yeah, even though it's hard work. You're right. I don't even know it's hard work. Yeah. Yep. This is what I love. This moss is your best friend in the woods. Makes good teepee sometimes too. But this is really thick, thick bark. It's probably that thick, right, to the wood. And I can still kind of, I can see it, right? It's hard to explain, really. You just kind of like get an eye for it. In order to make money at this, you have to see the wood before you cut it. You know, you, you got to think about it, you know. Do you, you want to make money or do you want to maybe make a little bit of money? If you're gonna do this, you gotta do it right. You know, other than that, you're just killing trees and that's stupid. That's some killer flame right there, I can tell you that much right now. This whole piece right here, like. Yeah, you, I could see it all through this bark right here. You can't see it, but I do. <laughs> this whole piece right here, that would be a good block. Um, I would take this tree down because I can tell you right now that those limbs up there are loaded with figure. Loaded, I can tell from here. You can almost see it in the, in the, in the, in the um, moss. <laughs> and in those, like, where it just hangs out, and then that one that comes up, like, there, those are money makers there. This is what I look for right here in a maple. You see how straight it is? And just, you got lobes that run up it, like, right here's a lobe, you know. Here's a lobe. Justin told us that 15 years ago, he learned from a friend how to find and cut figured big leaf maple. Since then, he has sometimes harvested them legally, sometimes illegally. Witnesses at his trial all agreed. Justin knows the woods, and he knows how to take down figured maples. I can see it through the bark. It's just it's kind of like the matrix, I guess you could say. You know, you just kind of see it. Justin's timing was no accident. He entered the music wood trade as the demand for Pacific Northwest maple was booming. In 2000, Carlos Santana's Grammy performance on a figured maple electric guitar spiked demand. The legal trade in maple exploded, and so did maple poaching. Like that tree right there would make you some money. It would, I mean, because you got a good straight run for about 40 feet, so maybe. But that isn't the reason why I came in here. I came here because it's just beautiful. Not very many people know about this place. So you guys are lucky. Have any of these been taken out? Yeah. I'm not gonna say who. <laughs> <laughs> Poachers, you know, they they say, hey, it's just a tree. Why should why should anybody care? But it's not just a tree. I think about about these kinds of trees, like you would um, think about maybe uh, elephant ivory or rhinoceros uh, horns. It, the, these trees are unique, and we don't know uh, whether or not at some point all the figured trees will be gone. I've, I've said this so many times that that everything in the woods or in the in the natural environment is worth something to someone whether it be trees or plants or uh, rocks or uh, you name it it's everything is worth something to someone 
And so it's just um, a matter of, of being a steward of the land to try to prevent these things from happening. The music industry and, you know, just the average person who purchases a guitar, I would really like to see them have an interest in this issue. I feel like they need to care. Justin's case made national news as the first federal case to use tree DNA as evidence. Plant geneticists matched tree stumps in the area of the maple fire to figured wood that Justin had sold to a local mill owner. At trial, those stumps were referred to as trees one, two, and three. The tree where the fire started was referred to as the origin tree. Justin admitted that he stole tree one, but he denied stealing trees two and three, and he denied ever being interested in the origin tree. Tree one, even the, even, I mean, that tree was probably the weirdest tree and the coolest tree I've ever seen in my life. How did you feel when you found that tree? Blessed, I did, because at that time I didn't have much. I didn't, and I needed something bad, you know? I just needed, you know, I don't, I'm a Christian and I, you know, my God provides for me. Not having any food in your belly, not having, you know, a way to get anywhere to do anything, you know, and you're just begging people, hey man, can I get a few bucks for gas, you know, I mean, can you help us out getting up, up to, you know, campsite? You know, me and Cassie would be up there for a week at a time, I mean, and we'd have minimal food, you know, our dog would get fed before we would, you know, and, and uh, I, I, I just can't, um, I, when you're at that low a point in your life, you're, you're just like, what? come on, please. I need something, you know? You know, at the time, yes, I did do drugs, but I didn't have any, you know? We wouldn't, we didn't have any means to have any money to, to get those things. Um, it, when we'd come down, you know, I mean, but it, I was just tired of living like that, you know, in a way. I, I just can't, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, I just like, I got to do something dr dramatic, you know, all right. So that's what I did. Regardless of what anybody says here, right, who are, who are, is anybody to tell me that I can't go cut a tree down out in our woods? You know, that's our land. That's not the government's land, right? Is it? I mean, do you think George Washington would have said, oh, pff, prosecute him, you know? I don't think so, you know? Our founding fathers gave this land to us, you know what I mean? That's, the National Forest is, our, is public land, right? Not government land, you know? I, I just don't... You do think back in the, uh, you know, the early 19... You know, do you think, you know... President Lincoln would have even cared if I cut a tree down up there. I mean, or anybody would have cared, right? Do you think anybody would have cared back in them days uh, if I cut a tree down? No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't even like, <laughs> you're gonna prosecute this guy for cutting a tree. <laughs> you know? Those are our trees really, you know what I mean? They are, you know I mean? Yeah, I probably shouldn't have took it, but that's our land, right? You should be able to go up there and and if you need something, you should be able to take what you need. I mean, not like, you know, rape the forest, but I'm just saying like, if you need something, you should be able to provide for yourself, you know, provi provide something. I, I don't know, I just think that these guys are being way overrated about the woods, you know what I mean? I'm not the kind of guy that just rushes out and I, I don't kill trees, you know, illegally because uh, I like to. I only do it because at the time I had to. And that tree made me get ahead. And, and we did, we got ahead and we bought, I bought a truck and then that truck led into the trailblazer and then we eventually got m moving and we got our trailer moved out to Harshina and I got a full-time job. I was, I was going, you know, it was starting to pick up 
and uh, I got rid of those people out of my life that were dragging me down. And you know, me and Cassie were doing good. And uh, then one day I get a knock on the door. <laughs> You're going to jail. Which I never thought in a million years I would be busted for the forest fire. My grandpa rolled over his grave. Mason County, where Justin and Cassie lived in the Maple Fire took place, ranks among the poorest counties in Washington state. At trial and sentencing, Justin's lawyers leaned into a poverty defense. They described a community where living wage jobs are few and far between, and many poor people live in cars or camp in the woods. His lawyers explain that some rely on disability income to get by. Others sell and use drugs, especially meth. You know, the Olympic Peninsula, having had this history of logging, there are people in the past who were loggers um, and then weren't employed. They thought, well, you know, I just need to pay for my kid's Christmas present, so I'll, I'll go out and steal a tree. That's not the way it's been uh, for the last, I don't know, 30 years or 20 years. It's more related to people who need money for a drug problem. Um, it's people who want easy money. Uh, if they lived in the city, these are the same people who would probably be stealing catalytic converters, or they would be stealing copper wire, um, or maybe even burglarizing uh, somebody's home or garage. This is a situation, though, when you're in you're in the Olympic on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, it's what's available. So, what is available? are things from the natural environment. Huh? We've heard people use the term meth maple. Meth maple. Never use the term like meth cedar. So we're just wondering like, why is there this association between meth use and ma figured maple? <sighs> Don't get me wrong. Um, meth played a it didn't really play a role with me, but it, I would have done it regardless. But um, most of the time, if you get high and you get out in the woods, you you get sketchy. You know, most people do, and they'll, you know, what was that noise? You know, I think that's what they're referring to. <laughs> See this here? Look at that. That's what I'm talking about right there. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Holy mackerel. Jesus. Look at this. Wow. It has to be in a blackberry patch. Oh yeah, of course it's always a... There we go. This is spalt right now. I mean, this would be, I, you, you could cut this and sell it still, because it's probably got the, you can see that the spalt's kicking in. And it's, this is in its prime right now for spalt. This is when you catch it right at the right time. <laughs> Prosecutors at Justin's trial said three men were present at the start of the Maple Fire. Justin, they claimed, was the ringleader. The second man, Sean Williams, who everyone knew as Thor, was Justin's muscle. His job was to help cut and carry out blocks. Prosecutors referred to the third man, Lucas Chapman, as Justin's minion. He was primarily there as a lookout. Thor testified that it was Justin or Lucas who actually lit the fire. Thor claimed to be allergic to bees, so he stood in a nearby creek, too far from the origin tree, to see what was happening. Lucas, for his part, testified that either Justin or Thor lit the fire. Lucas claimed that it was dark and difficult to see. 
He said the scene was hard to remember and confusing because all three men were drunk and high on meth. Justin didn't take the stand at his own trial. When he spoke to us later, he claimed that when the fire started, he was asleep in his tent. There were no other eyewitnesses. Prosecutors charged Justin with eight felony counts, including theft of federal property and use of fire in pursuit of a felony. The arson charges carried a mandatory minimum sentence of 10 years. Um. <clears throat> but it's still hurting me, I guess, in my heart that they're still accusing me of the fire. You know, they're still, you know, my heart was broken when that happened. You know what I mean? It was broken. I mean, th that's my home up there. I lived up there for the past six years. You know what I mean? Just, uh, that's where I hung out. That's where I, I did my camping. I mean, that's where we go all the time. I and mean, if we go somewhere, it's up there. My dog's buried up there. I mean, uh, just, that's my home up there. You know what I mean? That's where I go to get away from all the chaos and, you know, and just, be, be with the forest. I love it up there. And what Thor did was stupid. Um, I just that, cannot believe it out of, you know, I can understand the wood thing, you know, I mean, I understand, you know, because I knew what I was doing, you know, and I'm not here to tell anybody different, you know, I mean, I. And I'll, I'll admit to it, and I admitted to it the day that I talked to my attorneys. I said, yes, I cut that wood. <laughs> but I did not start a forest fire, you know what I mean? The next day I wake up, and uh, I haven't seen Thor. I didn't see Thor that whole time, right? And I went down to use the bathroom, right? And I seen fire trucks there. And I, I thought the smoke that was in the air was from Canada, because Canada was on fire. You know what I mean? It wasn't out of the norm to have smoke in the air, right? You got to think for one second, I'm third generation logger. What's our biggest fear in the woods? Fire. I mean, absolutely. I seen the fire trucks down there, but I didn't know there was a fire. I mean, I, I had no clue, right? When I shut my saw down in the woods, I stay there for 30 minutes to make sure that there's no fires. I've always done that. Thor was like, oh, bro, bro, I can't, dude, what's going on up there? And I'm like, there's, there's a fire, man. And he goes, Dude I, dude, I screwed up, man. I'm like, what? And he says, dude, I got stung, man. And, and uh, you know, I lit him up. I'm like, you did what? I lit him up, man. I, I you know, I didn't want him attacking me. You know what I mean? I'm like, you lit what up? He's like, the bees, man. And I said, are you stupid? And this is, a, you know, he's a big dude. You know what I mean? And, and he goes, what do you mean? I said, you lit the bees on fire, you know what I mean? You just don't run from them? I mean, that's what we do with logging, you know? We run from them, you know? We, just, we don't set them on fire, you know? And that's how we handle bees. That's how we do it when we're logging, you know what I mean? I don't know how many times I've stepped on a, on, on a ground hive and took off running the landing and getting six, stung 60 times, you know what I mean? Well, I still gotta get that tree out. So we go back down, we spray it, come back next day and they're gone. That's what we do. <laughs> we don't sprinkle gas on them and light them on fire. I've never eaten. Basically, they're, they're just saying that I'm just a stupid idiot and doesn't, don't know what I'm doing. You know, that's basically what they were saying. I've got 30 years experience in the woods and you're telling me that I'm, I'm going to dump gas on the bees and light them on fire. I don't care how high you are, right? That, that just, it still wouldn't be in that character. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> they, they said, Justin said he didn't have anything to do with that, but you know, I think he did, you know what I mean? Because Justin's a piece of crap, you know what I mean? Because, you know, I guess I'm a piece of crap. I mean, it says that in all the police reports. My attorney said this to me. They said, Justin, if you, we believe you, you know, because I took a lie detector test too. It came out inconclusive because I had an, like an irregular heart heartbeat. Sure, I might have, you know, everybody messes up. Everybody screws up, some, some worse than others. But I mean, everybody, that's life, you know. 
you just gotta live it, you know. And God will only throw at you what you what you can take. They tried making it sound like it was so bad, like I was just, yeah. That breaks my heart, you know, because I'm a good steward of the land. Remember I was telling you somebody's been in here? Because I noticed that this has opened up quite a bit. This was all huge canopies. Yeah, that was a big tree that they took down um, for nothing. So how much, I mean, like there's money being made in this stuff, right? There is. But who's um, making it? I could say I was, but I mean, uh, realistically, if you don't know what you're doing in this business, don't start. But if, uh, it's, I guess you can say it's been an addiction for me. And I hate to admit it, but it is. Um, and they warned me too, the people that helped, you know, guided me. They said, you'll never come back. And they're somewhat true. Um, it's almost like a, I don't know what draws me to it, but it is a, you know, you can't wait to find that next one. Um, you make money if you don't do what they did over there and take trees down that don't have anything in them, you know. Um, it's a waste of time and it's taking something dead. It's taking something down that didn't need to be. And, you know, it's like taking an animal's life and, you know, for its antlers, you know, instead of taking this meat, you know, like, right? This to me, that would, I would have been taking that, that animal's meat right there, you know, that's the way I see it. You know, um, I don't, the only reason why I wouldn't go out and even do anything like this would be just to get by, you know, because it's it was hard there for a little while, and I'm not gonna lie, uh, everything, you know, the choices I made to the uh, the situation I was in lead up to making you make decisions that. You know, you know, which way do you go? Do you, you do stupid stuff like rob your neighbors or do you take down a tree that, you know, that you can make money at and, and good money to get yourself by. But then once you start like getting to this place, you know what I mean? Uh, this would, you know, it, Cutters, you know, when they get that that sickness, they they'll just go in and they'll just take everything down, you know, and <laughs> not think about. They're only thinking about themselves, I guess you could say. This is quilt right here. You can tell by the way the bark is just spreading apart. Like Alan was trying to describe it, it's trying to open itself up. That and you can kind of see the the pattern in it. Like I would, I would. This would be a tree I would take down. In July 2021, a jury found Justin guilty of timber theft. They acquitted him, however, on the weightier charges of arson. He was sentenced to a total of 20 months in prison. It was a heavy sentence for timber theft alone. With the time that Justin had already spent in pre-trial detention. He had five months remaining on his sentence. Justin was due to start serving out that time shortly after we filmed him in the woods. It sucks sometimes you gotta pass him up. When I was younger, I, was, I did stupid stuff, you know, I'm not gonna lie, you know. I thought they all were mine, <laughs> you know. But this tree here, I mean, it, uh, those limbs up there are going to produce phenomenal figure. I guarantee it. I mean, I just, I, I, I know it here. Like, I wish I could climb up there and just, I want to check it right now. <laughs>
This is a wow tree, like, oh my God, like I would. <laughs> this is what you come out here for. I mean, that's, that's the money maker. That's just huge, isn't it? I mean, just look at me next to this thing, right? You imagine how you would put this thing in the ground, like how much work it would take. It's so cool. That's what they came in to see when this land, when they first started here, you know, that's what you've seen, you know, and that's what in the stories, you know, uh, that I've read, that's what they were seeing when they first came to, you know, Washington, you know, they were just seeing huge everything, you know, just, and you just don't see it anymore. And then, you know, I wish I could have been back in them days, you know, I really do. Everything was hard work and, you know, and, that's just I I don't I don't like this modern stuff. I don't really like any of it. <laughs> this is not for me. We're losing who we are, you know. We, Americans always been hard workers and um, always put her, you know, nose to the grindstone and got to work. And now nobody wants to do that. We're losing sight of that, you know, of that. It's sad. Like I've not met many people that work I'm, I'm a dying breed I guess you can say because when I work I don't stop until it's done Justin's story of hard work in the woods is of course a romantic retelling of the Olympic Peninsula's complicated and sometimes violent history the peninsula and its resources have long been fought over from U.S. colonization that stripped native people of their lands and waters to the timber wars of the 1980s and 90s to ongoing struggles over public lands today. The peninsula has never been simply the site of pristine woods and heroic labor. Theft, in fact, has been a through line in any honest telling of the region's history. Man, that would be a fun one. And it wouldn't do, it wouldn't really, uh, you'd have to put it right there between those, you couldn't miss, you couldn't miss on this one. And of course, it matters that Justin and others cut trees in the Olympic National Forest and that someone started the Maple Fire. But telling Justin's story only as a story of guilt and innocence or as a whodunit story of theft and fire misses much of what we learn from Justin. When you start hitting those trees, I mean, just and they snap and they fly everywhere. There are many ways to know and even love the forest. Sometimes those ways are affirming and sustaining, and sometimes they're violent and destructive. And at times, those two can't be separated. But this thing here is just unreal. As fire seasons grow longer, and as rural employment declines while the value of forested places and their products rise, different ways of living with forests become more interconnected and more difficult to reconcile. We didn't always know what to make of Justin's story, how to hear it, and how to retell it, but there's no question that his story is a forest story for these times. That's cool. Mm. So what do you guys think? Did I do all right? <laughs>